Okay, so then uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about how we can approach patients that cannot take any blood thinner or that do not want to take any blood thinner. Um, and we choose to uh, get rid of the appendage as the source, the, the origin of those strokes. So a few things about the CHATVAS score that I alluded to earlier, uh, just for a second, but I want to emphasize again. The CHATVAS score is congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, stroke, vascular disease, and female gender. Where is the appendage there? Nowhere. So we use, we use a, a system to assess risk of stroke coming from the appendage, and the system does not include the appendage. So when, we, uh, when I am put in the position to decide whether I want to close the appendage on a patient, I need to add a little bit more finesse than the CHATVA score. I need to make an assessment as to how much am I going to impact um, the patient's stroke risk by closing the appendage. And that's a little bit of a reflection that we need to go over. So again, four questions, and this can be a little bit uh, obscure, but in a given patient, I need to assess the causes of stroke risk uh, ver that come from the appendix versus not from the appendix. You may have a CHATVAS score. And that's what I try to see in this, show in this slide. A high CHATVAS score and no AFib, and the CHATVAS score still pre predicts bad, bad things happening, mortality, MI, stroke. Even in the absence of AFib, the CHATVAS score is good. So it's a non-specific system. Um, and it's, uh, it's shown here by showing you uh, two similar patients um, with identical CHATVAS score, but different clinical conditions, different clinical scenario. So one is a patient that has a 66 year old. Uh, so you get one point, female, you get another point, diabetic, you get another point, hypertensive, you get another point. It's got a calcium score on a CTA angiogram of 450 that illustrates vascular disease of the coronaries. And this lady has had persistent atrial fibrillation for two years. You could argue long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation since it's more than one year. We do a TE prior to cardioversion, so we decide to shock her out of AFib. And on the TE, we see a clot in the appendage. So you know that she hadn't had a stroke, but you know that she had a stroke in the making because she had a clot in the appendage. It's a matter of time for a piece of it to embolize and go to the brain. And we were able to resolve that thrombus after one month of blood thinners. Compare that to another patient with the same CHATVA score that has had two strokes, has ischemic cardiomyopathy. So far, I haven't said that the patient has AFib. They, uh, they show on, on echo that they have a mobile plaque in the aorta, which is just atherosclerosis with junk in there that, that can actually be quite mobile in the aortic arch. And this patient did not have AFib, but when it went through bypass surgery, and then very commonly, patients after bypass surgery will develop AFib. So now we have the diagnosis of AFib. Um, this patient has a high risk of stroke, has a high CHATVAS score. His AFib may or may not last beyond the post-op period. So his appendage-dependent risk of stroke is very little. And that did not come out of the CHATVA score, which was similar. Um, let me just skip this. But the idea here is you can have coexisting risk of stroke in the same patient that may not depend on AFib. And no matter how well you treat the appendix, the risk will be high. All right? So this is one of the things that I, I, dis I try to uh, discuss with the patients when, I, when we talk about closing the appendage. There's work uh, trying to make connections between um, appendage morphology and uh, risk of stroke. And a friend of mine, Dr. DiBiase, came up with this classification of different morphologies of the appendage. They call this a cactus, a broccoli, chicken wing. <laughs> it gets so confusing, I think. It really depends on how hungry you are. You will call it an appendage, <laughs> one thing or the other. Um, the chicken wing morphology, um, was reported to have less stroke risk. And this is something that, that we have done some work on, and there are some, some appendages that have long crevices, complex morphologies that you could understand how just one minute of AFib would lead to no flow and they could develop a stroke a clot right away. 
in any event, so we've decided with all these nuances and caveats that I just alluded to that we want to close the appendix. And obviously, um, like it happens with, in other aspects of medicine, this is a gold mine for industry. This is a, a, a huge potential money-making disease uh, for industry to come up with gadgets. There's a lot of patients with AFib, a lot of patients that cannot take blood thinners or will not take blood thinners or would prefer to not take blood thinners. So this is just a brief um, description of pictures of the different gadgets that are out there that companies are working on to come up with uh, devices or procedures to close the appendix. This guy here with the parach parachute shape is, called, is the Watchman device. This is the Amulet, which is by St. Jude. This is Boston Scientific, again, different companies. The Watchman is the one that has so far done the, work, the homework. They've done clinical trials looking at uh, their ability of this device to prevent strokes. There are some uh, strategies that are surgical, like this clip that the surgeons can deliver after the, ch the chest is open, and others that are in development. Um, so the Watchman, this one, is the one that has been studied in, three, in two randomized clinical trials comparing Watchman versus Warfarin. And I'm not going to bother you with all the details of the clinical trials. Let me just, in one slide, that summarizes what we have found uh, in two trials that combine more than 2,000 patients um, with five years of follow-up. If you look at efficacy, so how efficacious is the device compared to warfarin? And efficacy is defined as uh, all stroke or systemic embolism and cardiovascular unexplained death. So overall, if you combine all these all these outcomes, um, the this this uh, bar crosses the unit, yeah, the one, the unity line. So it, it was no different. War, Watchman is no different to Warframe and all these combined things. But let's look at the one of them one by, each of them one by one. All stroke, again, similar. Watchman is identical to Warframe at preventing stroke. Ischemic stroke is not that great, actually. It favors Warframe. But hemorrhagic stroke, it's an 80% reduction. Um, and again, if you take is of the ischemic strokes, some of the ischemic strokes in the Watchman group happen during the actual procedure or deploying the Watchman. Nothing is free, and procedures are not free. Anytime you get into a procedure, you need to puncture a vein, you need to get into the left atrium, puncture the septum, deploy a, a gadget in the left atrium. It can be, it, you can tear the heart, you can create a, a air embolism, so no procedure is free of risks. But if you exclude a procedural strokes, which were interestingly related to air bubbles in the sheath that we use to deploy the watchman, then the risk is a little bit less. Then also the fascinating thing is cardiovascular unexplained death, a 50% reduction in the watchman group. And how do you explain this? If you're saying, okay, we, we prevent strokes similar to warfarin, somehow people live more when you put the watchman. And this comes from the fact that we prevent hemorrhagic strokes so much. And hemorrhagic strokes are the ones that kill patients. Hemorrhagic strokes are the ones that actually lead to disability. Um, an ischemic stroke, you may be left with some, uh, some disability after. You may have some uh, slurred speech or some difficulty moving an arm. But for the most part, these are small strokes. Uh, the hemorrhagic strokes are the ones that tends to be, tend to be catastrophic. And those are the ones that by simply not taking any anticoagulant. Uh, the watchman excels at preventing. Um, again, there was major ble bleeding was similar in warfarin compared to watchman because there you trade the bleeding risk of taking warfarin for, for, for years um, with the bleeding risk of a one-time procedure. So when you puncture the vein, get into the, into the left atrium, you may tear uh, the, the appendage wall and create tamponade. Those are procedural bleeds that all, all in all it evens out, um, but it has to be taken into account overall. The interesting thing is once you get your um, procedure done, you're home free. Let me explain that. So if you look at bleeding <clears throat> and you look at the patients taking a watch, get, taking warfarin versus getting a watchman, and you divide uh, patients in different time intervals, so bleeding uh, from the time of implant to seven days, in the warfarin group, in seven days taking warfarin, the risk of bleeding is zero. 
it's, too, it's, it's very small. It takes, it takes years or months on Warframe to get it bleeding events. In one week, basically nobody bled in the, in the Warframe group. But you got here patients that got the Watchman. Some of them got pericardial effusion. Some of them got vascular access problems. So here, from zero to seven days, more patients in the Watchman group had bleeding. Then you look at uh, from eight to 45 days. This is important because when you get a Watchman, for 45 days, you need to give anticoagulation. You need to give anticoagulation because that parachute structure that you put in the appendix needs to get endothelialized. And it may develop a clot if you don't. So there is still, so for 45 days, you give warfarin to patients that are on Watchman. So there's still a little bit more bleeding in the Watchman group. 45 days to 180 days, patients in the Watchman study, they were taking uh, aspirin and Plavix. That's a, that's a significant uh, level of blood thinning, but you can see how the trends reverse here. At the beginning of 45, 45 days, more patients in the warfarin group, in the Watchman group were having bleed, and then at the end, more patients in the warfarin group were. Uh, and then if you look at what we call destination therapy, so patients that get a Watchman, six months after the Watchman, you put them on aspirin alone, and that's what they need. They don't need any, blood, any other blood thinner. Of course, if you compare those patients that are only taking aspirin with patients that are taking warfarin, you see how the bleeding uh, events are a lot less in the patients that got the Watchman, 71% uh, reduction in major bleeding. So again, you pay the price, one-time price of a procedure with its possible complications. But once you're um, out of the procedure, you're home free, and you get equivalent reduction, protection against stroke, as I said, much better protection against hemorrhagic stroke with a watchman, and much better protection against bleeding uh, compared to the warframe. Now, you might have heard the, the tribulations and the struggles that, that the manufacturer went through to get the watchman approved. It went to three FDA panels, which is unheard of for any, for any device in the FDA, in the history of the FDA. That's because of procedural risk. The, the FDA was concerned that this could be a very dangerous procedure. So indeed, if you look at safety events, which are uh, procedural strokes or bleeding or death in the procedure, uh, overall, this combined uh, uh, safety events with, with mostly uh, pericardial tamponade and vascular access, 9.9% .9 in the first half of the first study protect AF. Now, with more experience, it dropped by half. And that reduction persisted after, after uh, more, more ongoing studies. The point here is these guys came up with a device. They showed the FDA they had something that could be studied. The FDA approved the study design. They started doing it in patients. And then they realized, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to do this. And you know, at some point after 200 patients, they, they said, well, we got to stop and see what's going on because 10%, almost 10% of the patients having a safety event is, is a big deal. So they, they paid the price of, of generating uh, this collective knowledge for the rest of us. We reviewed how, how the watchman was being deployed and we realized, well, you need to put a pigtail, you need to do certain things for safety when you, when you're putting a sheath in the left atrial appendage, that if you don't do them, you get into these risks. They did not know, some of them did not know how to cross the septum from the right atrium to the left atrium. Basic things that now, now uh, have become just daily, our daily bread, uh, they were having problems. They had procedural strokes because air bubbles got into the sheath. That's as basic as it gets when it comes to uh, uh, cardiac catheterization techniques. The first thing you learn as a fellow is don't don't get air bubbles in the in the arterial system. They could go to the brain. These are things that, uh, not to disqualify them, but it's a complex procedure, complex sheath management that could that definitely led to unexpected complications. And once they got better, and they generated knowledge that the rest of us could benefit from, you can see how the overall incidence of safety events is very low in the post marketing uh, registry, safety events are 2.2%. So really makes sense um, that if this is a potentially complex procedure, you need to learn how to do it. 
And in fact, the manufacturer right now has training courses that we, we host one training course here as to how to do it and no new operator can imp implant this device without going through the learning. One thing that's important that, that I won't dwell too much on is um, again, emphasizing that patients may have multiple risk factors for stroke and that not all of them come from the appendage and you need to make an assessment. If they have, you know, depending on the studies, you can look at, you can find that some patients, some patient populations, up to 25% of the strokes in patients that have AFib may not come from AFib, may come from cerebral vascular disease if they have carotid plaques. So you gotta take a look at the patient as a whole, not just as the appendage. And, and there may be benefit from taking blood thinners besides AFib. Not uncommonly, you may have a patient that has a history of DVTs. If the patient has a DVT and a pulmonary embolism, you need to be anticoagulated and the watch money is not gonna help you. And it's a common association. A lot of, a lot, many times patients with a pulmonary embolism will develop AFib. And of course, if you look at the chats vas score, they may have a chats vas score. If you put a watchman, you're not gonna help them much because they still need to be on blood thinner. So uh, these are things to keep in mind. So how do we keep, how do we make decisions uh, as to how, which strategy to use uh, for stroke prevention in AFib? There are some cases that are easy. So patients with extreme risk, um, if, if you have an appendix thrombus, that's a stroke in the making. You really have to make sure that goes away and you're gonna give them anticoagulation for sure. And you're, gonna, you're going to um, assess whether that goes away and if it doesn't go away, you may look for surgery to take out the appendage, including the clot or other strategies. Um, NOACs, because of their best data, I think are the first choice currently and I hardly ever start warfarin on a patient with AFib. Um, for stroke prevention because NOACs ha have a much better track record at giving you reliable, consistent levels of blood thinners. But warfarin is here to stay. Number one reason to take warfarin is, is patients that have financial constraints. They will, they, warfarin is dirt cheap and it's a good drug. And uh, some patients with certain insurance plans may need to pay like $400, $500 a month to take the NOAC. So it may not be worth it. And if you have stable INRs and warfarin and no bleeding and good tolerance, why pay you know, 100 times the, the, the price for a drug that will do the same for you? Now, Watchman becomes an issue, patients that have bleeding on anticoagulation, the patients that have a stroke despite anticoagulation, patients that cannot tolerate any other blood thinners. A hemorrhagic stroke is a bad combination because you, it doesn't eliminate the need of blood thinners, but it, it basically gives you a contraindication for blood thinners, hemorrhagic stroke, many of them will, will have a, a lifelong uh, contraindication to blood thinners. And if the patients are procedural candidates, the truth is the watchman is a very benign procedure. It all, if everything is fine, the patient just goes through a venous puncture and a TE. So it's not, not particularly aggressive a procedure. Back a few years ago, we had the Lariat procedure and that was far more aggressive on the patient. And if you have patients that have, like I said, high left atrial appendage uh, dependent risk of stroke, like a, a history of a clot, um, I would have a low threshold to give uh, a watchman. But again, the key here is that you have, to, you have to individualize the approach on every patient. A few points, uh, this is very long, but what I wanted to, to emphasize is that there are certain conditions that do not follow the chats vas score, and that is worth reminding you. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for reasons we don't really understand, has a higher risk of stroke than other, other, other substrates of uh, AFib. And you don't need to follow the chats vas scoring system. If you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anticoagulation is indicated, in the, independent of the chats vas score, okay? And um, that's about it.